Hey everybody, um, all right, so this is the asynchronous component of the lecture that I uh, promised. Um, at the end of the synchronous lecture, I, I mentioned that we'd be doing this uh, case study of uh, modeling of SLC 2633 inhibitors as a, uh, as a, you know, part of the next synchronous lecture. Uh, I, d I redecided and decided and chose to basically uh, present it today in the asynchronous lecture, just get done with it. Because we, we have a couple things we still want to get through, and I, I just want to make sure we don't run out of time. All right, good. So first, we're going to talk about this SLC 26A3 project very briefly, um, and then we'll jump into the pro-drug uh, lecture after that. Um, and r remember, the main thing we're trying to highlight right now is uh, these cool chemical informatics and computational tools and just to, to show you what, what is available and some of the things you can do with them. All right, so what is SLC 26A3? Um, well, it's a protein that, it's a chloride channel that's expressed in the intestinal lumen uh, membrane and it, and it uh, is involved in, you know, dietary ion uh, absorption things like chloride, also uh, oxalate, and some other anions. Um, uh, and the, the inhibitor scaffold that we, we discovered uh, is a chlorocumarin. So in coumarins, we're going to show the structure in a bit. But it's just a heterocycle with an oxygen in it, basically. And then the 8-chloro thing is something we, we discovered. Um, Protein's name is SLT26A3. It's a chloride channel. Uh, it's also called DRA. Um, and since it's involved in uh, I ion absorption, uh, we um, uh, have identified a couple diseases re related to ion absorption that could be targeted by SLC26A3 inhibitors. And that includes constipation and also kidney, kidney stones. I have, because uh, uh, SLC26A3 is also involved in dietary oxalate absorption and oxalate, calcium oxalate is what kidney stones are. I have some pretty cool uh, cartoon diagrams of, the, of this. I, uh, in the interest of time, I, I'm cutting this down to really focusing on the computational tools. If you see a seminar of this project that I give, like at the department seminars, I, I go through this in a lot more detail. But anyway, for now, yeah, it's, it's a drug target for constipation and kidney stones. Um, the things I want to highlight today are uh, some of the computational tools, homology modeling, which we've talked about, docking of small molecules into a protein, and also molecular dynamics. So kind of focusing on that, that stuff uh, for today's presentation. But I will, you know, summarize some of the stuff we did um, in this pretty huge project. Uh, lots of synthesis, <laughs> my favorite thing in the world. So, and that's, that's something I'm not going to talk about today. Um, but we we've ended up making a library of about 20 compounds uh, related to the scaffold. We did all the biological characterization at UCSF. It's a cool assay that's pretty easy to do. So. We did all that kind of stuff, but still focusing on the computational modeling today. Uh, this does show a little bit of the results. Um, and um, well, first of all, the, the the lead structure, the previous lead structure, uh, uh, sh this sh has that cumarin I was talking about. It's a benzene and next to a another uh, six-member ring with an oxygen and a carbonyl, so like a cyclic ester. And another double bond. It's got some alkyl groups. We have a couple methyl groups here. We have the CH2 and the carboxylic acid. Over on the left, there is a uh, benzyl, an I iodobenzyl, 3 iodobenzyl. Benzyl means benzene next to CH2, right? Um, what they did at UCSF was they, they for the most part, they, uh, the, the postdoc that was working on this uh, kept the, the middle part the same and then did uh, some exploration of like the right side and the the left side. On the right side, uh, she uh, you know extended it a bit. She added extra CH2, so like CH2, CH2, also some esters and various things like that. 
this was found to be the best. CH2 followed, uh, next to a carboxylic acid was the best. She did not vary the coumarin, the alkyl things, the methyls. So that's something we decided to do. But she did also some variation of the benzyl on the left. So different substituents like, you know, iodo, benzyl, or bromo, chloro, methyl, trifluoromethyl, various things over here on the left. So as a project for us, what we decided is, is we were going to vary uh, the coumarin a little bit and particularly add things like a chlorine or a bromine or a uh, fluorine or maybe an extra methyl. And we did that and we, we eventually found that the, the chlorine was actually uh, the best, best thing we could uh, uh, substitute there. And also we did some variation of the benzyl group. Uh, trifluoromethyl, we did some other things, bromine, chlorine, uh, iodine, just like before. And, and it kind of just did a bunch of uh, mixed, you know, combination of varying this thing, varying that thing. We came up with about 20 compounds. This, this turned out to be the best. IC50 is about 17 nanomolar, which is pretty, pretty good. And it was an improvement of over the 40 nanomolar lead compound. So that was, that was a nice um, uh, discovery. Uh, on the, uh, over here on the, r the left is the dose response curve of uh, the lead compound on the, the right, cur right side curve. The um, dose response of our new compound on the, on the left, and you can definitely see that the left compound is more potent because the curve is to the left. The logarithmic, uh, the, the, the log uh, concentration is the x-axis in micromolar. So this is a way to um, kind of I, I don't know how to say it, but like squeeze the the uh, the x-axis down because it's logarithmic. Um, zero is one micromolar, and of course, at one micromolar, there's uh, you know a one one uh, logarithm logarithm sorry logarithm of one one micromolar is zero, and uh, so that's the one micromolar point. And of course, we have 100% inhibition by both compounds. And as we as we start going to the left, we have uh, decreased concentration. Uh, negative one is a, a 100 nanomolar, and the left compound is you know less than 100 nanomolars, about 40 nanomolar. And that's uh, and this the, basically the 50% point is 40 nanomolar on the left, sorry the the right side curve, which is the lead compound. Okay, and then we also uh, uh, evaluated our compound, and it's definitely more potent. And, and the IC50 came at about 17 nanomolar, so that was that was cool. Um, okay, so but I really want to highlight the modeling, <laughs> the, like the the whole theme of this lecture series is comp computational modeling, and we did some cool stuff, and I want to show it. Okay, there's Maria doing the, some of the biologic. Whoa, my my head is in the way. There's Maria doing some of the computational modeling over at UCSF, uh, the assay, the cell-based assay of uh, potency. All right, good. So what is the, what are the uh, computational approaches we used for a putative mode of binding of these compounds with SLC 26A3? Well, first thing we did was uh, there's no uh, crystal structure of SLC 26A3. So we did that thing we were talking about before where we took the protein sequence and we created a homology model. Um, and I, use, I used a program called Yasara, which I mentioned is a commercially available kind of general modeling program that we, we paid a little bit of money for. Um, and it, it makes nice homology models. Um, so Yasara created the model. And the thing I'm kind of not showing is is uh, what the template is, and the, the template is uh, uh, SLC twenty six A nine, which is a related protein. Uh, we also were modeling the human form of SLC twenty six A three, while the template I think was mouse mouse twenty six A nine, and so the mouse structure has a, a electron microscopy microscopy structure, and so we were able to create this uh, protein structure. For uh, you know, putative structure of human SLC 26A3. What's the little gray stuff in the background? You can kind of see that was uh, that's the the lipid. I actually embedded the molecule um, into a simulated lipid. So um, a bunch of molecules called POPC, 
it's, I think it's phosphatidylcholine or a derivative of that, but it's, it's these, these lipid molecules. So not only do we have the protein, we also have the lipid in there. Okay, so then given that lipid, lipid bound to protein, we, we did docking and we identified some binding pockets in the cytoplasmic region, which we, we, uh, we have evidence that the molecule binds into the cytoplasmic region. So the bottom is cytoplasmic, the top is extracellular, so the outside of the cell. This is the inside of the cell, which we, we um, uh, have confirmed that that's where the, the molecule binds. And we docked our lead inhibitor. And so you can kind of see um, our uh, compound binds into the uh, binding pocket. That, that's a, a uh, you know, tentative binding confirmation um, of, the, of the inhibitor. All right, cool. So, and then we used molecular dynamics to kind of go a step further to study the orientation of binding and the stability of the protein ligand complex, right? Just because it docks doesn't mean that it, it actually, you know, will stay there. And under dynamic conditions, the, the ligand might fall out. <coughs> and also the energetics of binding. So we, we obviously want low binding energy, which means uh, uh, favorable interaction. That's, that's kind of what we were hoping to see. Okay. Um, also the orientation of binding. What does that mean? Because this thing is a kind of linear molecule, it could poke in one direction or it could poke in, in the opposite direction. And we can dock it almost either way and then, but maybe figure out, you know, which is the good way by, by using molecular dynamics and, and using uh, energetic uh, binding energy d determination. Okay, so I just have a couple movies to show, show the, the, the cool things I did. First one is uh, just a zoom out to show what it kind of looks like, and this kind of highlights how crazy the <laughs> the uh, you know all the stuff we're doing in this simulation. Okay, so I have a YouTube video. You can you're welcome to clip that into YouTube yourself. Um, let's move my face out of the way. Okay, and I'm gonna just open up YouTube and and show that this little video I, I made. So. Let's play it play here, and so you can see. Um, whoops. Um, what's all going on? This looks like a total mess, right? Well, so the, the video is a little low res. If you open up YouTube, you can uh, see this for yourself. Um, but the purple thing is the protein in all the alpha helices. Uh, all the things on the top are water on the outside of the cell. All the things on the bottom are water on the inside of the cell. So they're all every every atom is equilibrating rapidly over you know nanoseconds. And we also have all the lipid molecules that I'm not showing because they would obstruct the protein, right? So I'm, I've kind of made those invisible. But every atom of lipid is also equilibrating. So, you know, uh, it's hard for, uh, maybe hard for you to appreciate that this actually is a kind of a computationally intensive process, right? We know computers are pretty fast and computers are pretty good at doing things. But on a normal computer, this is actually kind of a, a, a really slow process to simulate every one of these atoms over such a long period of time. Also that little yellow thing in the middle is my, my ligand. So the ligand's in there and it's stable, right? <laughs> the ligand, di ligand didn't just float away. So uh, yeah, okay, that's, a, that's the first video. Oh yeah, one more thing about this. Um, what kind of computer do you need for this sort of simulation? Um, uh, can I just use any old laptop or desktop? Well, you can, but it's a very slow process, and it may take a month to do, a, a, you know, uh, 50, 50 nanoseconds is a, t a typical time frame of, like, you know, to watch the dynamics of a ligand binding to a protein. 50 nanoseconds might take you a month or two months on a normal computer. So we use a special uh, computer, uh, well, a special piece of hardware. Um, um, that accelerates the simulation. Uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, uh, 
the 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 developers of uh, well uh, the molecular dynamics community discovered a type of computer hardware that you can use to accelerate these simulations um, and the the this the um, hardware is called a GPU graphical processing unit it's a thing I, I'm just Amazon searching to show you what what an example is GPU so these are um, these are uh, basically as a graphics card for a computer and uh, people use them for graphics we're not using it for graphics though we're using it to simulate all the atoms right and uh, so we're you know yeah you see graphics here but that's not what we're using it for it's it, the the card allows you to do a lot of parallel communication uh, parallel computations and we're using it simply to model every one of those hydrogen atoms and you know carbon atoms and over a period of time these GPUs contain a whole bunch of little mini processors maybe like 600 to a thousand little processors like a CPU and in where we basically use them as part of the simulation and the other uh, just thing to bring up uh, the computer program we use for molecular dynamics is called amber and uh, there is a uh, Whoops, Amber is the, the the program. This is developed at a few universities, um, including UCSF and like Scripps Research Institute. Um, but Amber has has this GPU page where they talk about all of the uh, acceleration and benchmarks and uh, the speed improvements that you get with like they, they show like different GPUs and like the the uh, acceleration you get by different GPUs so with like different proteins that they simulate anyway so bottom line GPUs are really cool as a computational tool to accelerate molecular dynamics it used to be a month-long process now it's maybe uh, maybe a uh, maybe a three-day process to do this kind of simulation maybe upward, maybe five days but it's it's not a month <laughs> okay all right so that's that's just kind of a zoom out let's go into the next simulation which is well, actually the same it's the same simulation but I'm, I'm showing the the inhibitor bound in a bad orientation what we think is a bad orientation all right so I'm going to show this video now and what I mean by bad orientation let's move my face out of the way again um, so you can envision the po binding pocket as this little kind of cavity type thing, and um, and the inhibitor has a carboxylate, right? As carboxylic acid loses a proton, it's a carboxylate in physiological pH, and there's all there happens to be an arginine 164 that's kind of in the distance, and in this conformation, the 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 negatively charged thing can't really talk to the positively charged thing. And we think that that's actually a kind of a critical interaction. So what we're going to show is what we, what we think is a bad conformation of the ligand. And then we're going to show the good conformation where the, the, the ligand is flipped over and then can actually talk to the <coughs> arginine. So the inhibitor carboxylate's not positioned to make a contact with that polar amino acid residue. Not only is it polar, but it's charged. Okay. Okay, so let's show the video. Okay, so let's go to the beginning. All right, so what you can see here is um, and you're able to watch that video yourself too. Yeah, uh, uh, the the inhibitor is the thing that's kind of a little like here on the right a bit, and there's the carboxylate. So the carboxylate is kind of poking out, kind of into the cytoplasmic space, right? Because there's like the ins in inside of the cell area. The, the the protein that we're, we're bound to kind of inward into you know, like it towards the center of the channel and then um, the carboxylate's kind of uh, just out there in space uh, the arginine is f deeper into the pocket I think it's um, 
it's a little it's a little d deeper in there. I think it's maybe maybe the blue residue right right there. But the big thing is it can't make an interaction with it. Um, actually, I think it's down down there. We're just kind of orienting we're, we're orienting the camera in a way that we can't see it too well. But the carboxylate's on the kind of far away from it. Okay, so now let's go to the postulated good confirmation. So the third video, which uh, is a good orientation of the molecule. So I'm going to show this video in a second. Uh, so basically what, what, what we're going to see is that the, the ligand is bound, but in a way that the carboxylate kind of pokes the opposite direction. And even maybe more cool is that the carboxylate is a little far away initially, and that with simulation, it's kind, of, it's kind of obstructed by the protein, but with simulation that allows all the atoms to equilibrate, the, li li blah, the ligand actually advances closer and makes a very nice interaction of like maybe two, two angstroms away, um, right? And so MD can do this, docking can't. Docking, it's like it, you know, the protein's kind of static, and the ligand just kind of sneaks in there and just fits. But with MD simulation, the molecule can actually move around a bit and, and it is able to find this nice complementary interaction. Okay, so let's watch the video. <clears throat> okay, so what we're seeing here is that um, the the molecule, the the ligand, is kind of uh, laid laid sort of uh, flat here, and it's got whoa, it's a little slow here. Come on, but in the carboxylate is now uh, closer to the arginine. It's still kind of far away. Uh, the little numbers we see are the distance. So it's like, was it like seven, six, eight angstroms? That's kind of a far distance for a uh, ionic interaction, right? So it's kind of far away, far away, far away. So we just have to watch it a bit, and then we're going to see that the the uh, due to the molecular di dynamics, the ligand is able to advance really close. Okay, I'm going to jump ahead in the movie a bit. So it's still far away. It's seven, eight angstroms, right? Far, far, far away. Okay, so let's keep letting it go. Nine angstroms is far. It's really far. So, but by allowing all those atoms to uh, equilibrate, it eventually finds a really close interaction. It's going to come pretty soon. Watch out for it. Eight angstroms. Eight angstroms. Seven angstroms. Seven angstroms. Eight angstroms. Eight angstroms. Okay. And it's still far, far away. Uh, six, seven. Uh, I just saw five. It's getting closer, getting closer. Oh, three, four, two. Now, like one angstrom, two angstroms. Now you can see the ligand is right there, talking directly to the arginine atoms in a very close interaction. One to two angstroms, three. So it massaged its way into a very nice uh, position. And so this is what we kind of hypothesize is, is our uh, binding confirmation of these chimerons. Okay, um, I'll just stop it. And anyway, so one of the things we're doing in this project is we're going to um, uh, see if we can like remove that arginine to see if the if the arginine is actually involved in the the binding and do site directed mutagenesis and things like that. But in the meanwhile, we have a nice potent inhibitor, and we're, we're happy about that. I think that's it for this case study. We're, now we're just going to jump into the uh, prodrug section, which is a, a bunch of cool uh, uh, modifications of drugs to make them more, more uh, absorbable and, and, and to deal with other um, uh, kind of undesirable features in drugs. OK, so we're done, done with this little case study. I'm glad we got it out of the way. It was kind of a cool. Uh, closure to all the computational tools we've been looking at.
Hey everybody. Um, all right, so we're entering this uh, next section on prodrugs and drug delivery methods. This is a nice um, kind of extension of what we've been talking about before, and it, it just shows how we can use organic chemistry to um, to kind of uh, change the drug absorption properties of, of substances and um, and just modify the structure of the drug so that it, it works a little bit better, right? And this, this all follows out of our basic organic chemistry knowledge. All right. So this, this book again, let me change my photo over here. Um, this book again is, is really helpful, The Organic Chemistry of Drug Design and Drug Action. Action. Uh, by Silverman and Holiday. It, a lot of what I've, I'm talking about is coming right out of this book, and it um, it's just a good organic chemistry text related to me medicinal chemistry principles. And it's uh, chapter nine that I'm going to be lecturing out of. Um, there's another book, Drug-like Properties, Concepts, Structure, Design, and Methods. It also has a lot of these uh, topics as well. Um, how to improve drug feature features such as metabolic stability, etc. Okay, let's move my photo again. All right, so what are what are the things we're going to talk about? Um, um, well, first, overview the concept of prodrugs, how they're beneficial. Um, we're going to also talk about. Um, well, most of what we're going to talk about are carrier-linked bipartite prodrugs, which are, we'll explain what that is, is but basically two, two parts of a drug that uh, get separated for various um, improvements of the drug. Increased water solubility, improved absorption and distribution, site specificity, drug stability, uh, prolonged release, minimizing toxicity, and also encouraging patient acceptance. That's an interesting one because some drugs taste really horrible. If you can avoid the nasty taste, well, then, then people will more likely take them. We'll also talk about this idea of a carrier-linked tripartite prodrug um, and something called a bioprecursor prodrug. And, and then we're going to get into this uh, kind of a, a side topic of hydrogels as a vehicle for drug delivery. That's pretty cool. And then we're going to get into antibody drug conjugates, which is another a little, a little, little different than the than traditional prodrugs, but it's also, um, you know, a, 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 some part of an organic molecule that... Um, is attached to an antibody, like a linker or something that can be released at a at the drug target, like a tumor site or something. Okay, so let's get into the there's an overview of the concept of prodrugs. What is a prodrug? We've we've heard the word a bunch. Prodrug is a pharmacologically inactive compound that is converted into an active drug by metabolic transformation. Uh, the activation process could be non-enzymatic, so like hydrolysis of a group, like an ester or something, um, just by, by, you know, presence of water or something. And, <clears throat> but if that was the case, it would make the drug inherently unstable, right? Because it, it would just <laughs> degrade readily if it, if it just sat on the, on the bench top or something. Uh, prodrug to drug conversion can occur uh, before, during, or after absorption at a specific site in the body. Um, and all of those <coughs> happen, and we'll, we'll see examples of all of them. A carrier-linked prodrug is a compound that contains a, an active drug linked to a carrier group that can be cleaved enzymatically, typically an ester cleavage, because esters are really easy to cleave, okay? Um, the prodrug to drug conversion can also occur before, during, or after absorption at a specific site. Then we have the concept of bar bipartite and tripartite drugs. So bipartite drug is a drug connected to a carrier 
and then at some point the carrier gets clipped off and then you have the drug released. Um, it's a one-step cleavage process. A tripartite drug, uh, prodrug, is a drug linked to a linker linked to a carrier, and it's a two-step cleavage. So, um, so you know, both things have to be released, I guess. Let's remove my photo. There we are. All right. Uh, and then there's this concept of a bioprecursor prodrug. It's a compound that more that's more substantially metabolized to the active substance uh, versus simple simple cleavage. So we'll we'll see that example as well. Okay, so let's get into these uh, carrier-linked bipartite prodrugs, which is the majority of these substances that we're going to talk about. Um, all right, so, and we'll start with increased water solubility, and then move on to the improved absorption and distribution and things like that. So for increased water solubility, maybe we should start with a drug that's really poorly water soluble. soluble. And um, a common example is prednisolone or methyl prednisolone, which are steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And steroids are very greasy, right? Um, so poor, poorly aqueous soluble and <coughs> and very uh, greasy. So it's a steroid. And uh, that what's the difference between prednisolone and methyl prednisolone? Is it's the R group? It's either a hydrogen or a CH3. The molecules are called pralone or depomedrol, um, and those are used as, as uh, steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs um, already, but there's enhancements to the structure that can, can make them more uh, water-soluble. Um, and um, by yeah, by attaching certain things, the drugs are more soluble. This is really uh, this really helps if you're doing an injection or um, like a eye drop or something like that. It's like to to treat an eye infection or something. Now, when does it not matter that it's soluble? Maybe if it's in a, a cream or something like. Uh, like that you would rub onto onto your skin, well then the solubility is not as big of a deal, but when you're putting something into your eye, it needs to be soluble, right? <laughs> okay, so there's two goals to consider when we're designing this the prodrug. One is the stability of the aqueous solution. So we want it to be like, um, we want it to be fairly stable, right? Uh, if you if you make this prodrug and it just degrades over a month or something like that, it's not a very useful pharmaceutical. But if it can last a couple of years, maybe the half life up to upward to like 13 years, then that would be a, an ideal feature of the the molecule. Another thing is once once it's in your eye or or like in your um, blood we would like it to be hydrolyzed kind of rapidly. So if you can if you can solve both of these problems, then you have a pretty cool uh, prodrug. So what are some of the ways we can do that? Modify the structure to allow this for increased water solubility. Okay, so there's two prodrug strategies that have been devised um, to deal with these two steroids. <clears throat> One is attachment of a succinamide group. What's a succinamide group? It's it's a five carbon. I think it's five carbons, five or four carbons. Um, but it's a it's a piece uh, that can be readily hydrolyzed. Another thing is attachment of a phosphate group. Phosphates are very aqueous soluble, or they certainly enhance the aqueous solubility. Okay, so the prodrug designs then. One is. Um, Essentially, just attaching this, th these couple atoms here. This, this, this is yeah. So I said four carbons. I guess one, two, three, four. A succinamide group, and it has a sodium salt at the end. The molecule is called uh, methylprednisolone sodium succinate. 
succinate is this this thing and it's the sodium salt of it and as a sodium salt it's that it really enhances the aqueous solubility then that drug then is called solumedrol um, this is the methyl version I guess yeah uh, okay, and so in the body, what happens is that the sodium salt gets turned into a carboxyl, carboxylic acid, and then the oxygen swings in, kicks us off, and then basically releases methylprednisolone, um, the the drug, which is pretty cool. And that's then this is the the, the drug solumedrol, which can be administered IV. <coughs> um, and then we have the alternate option of just making a phosphate, a di disodium phosphate. So this prednisolone phosphate disodium, and pr prednisolone is the one without the methyl group. Um, but phosphates are readily, uh, uh, well, very a aqueous soluble, right? Um, so, so in your body, you have these enzymes called phosphatases, and they just cleave phosphates, and then oh, and then that releases prednisolone. So these are some pretty cool kind of general strategies that are used <coughs> for predrugs. Uh, this is Pedia-Pred. It's an oral solution that can be taken. Uh, so it's an orally absorbable um, uh, formulation of prednisolone. Um, one, uh, actually, actually, when I have this, these uh, This little uh, container, what, it, what that actually is, is a, <coughs> it's a lyophilized sodium salt. So it's like a freeze-dried sodium, sodium salt. And it's, you, you need to basically reconstitute it. So this, this solution is, you, you need to um, uh, kind of add water to it to get it dissolved 48 hours before use. And that's a little bit of a, a disadvantage or inconvenience. Uh, whereas the the phosphate form seems to be more stable. Um, another example is uh, etoposide. It's a uh, anti-tumor agent. Um, I think it's um, maybe, a, maybe a heat shock protein inhibitor. I, I can't remember the second. But anyway, it's uh, uh, used for anti-cancer activity. Um, and it's very uh, poorly aqueous soluble. So is there anything we can do to make it more soluble? Well, we can use the same exact uh, thing we were just talking about and just um, make, make it phosphate. It's got a, a phenol here. And then uh, by adding the phosphate, <coughs> that enhances aqueous solubility, and then it's a, um, something that can be injected pretty pretty easily, and then it's cleaved by phosphatases to uh, to uh, release the drug. Okay, it's also been formulated like like is there a way to just skip the pro drug altogether? It can be uh, formulated with detergents like tween. 20 and uh, poly polyethylene glycol peg um, and, e and ethanol. The problem is those formulations are kind of toxic also in in the the high quantities needed of, for, of this drug. Um, so that's kind of a problem. And then having the phosphate uh, avoids needing to use um, these kind of nasty formulating formulating agents. Um, and so they can deliver the phosphate really uh, rapidly in more constant on higher concentration over a shorter period of time and it's cleaved by phosphatases okay um, another example uh, for improved absorption and distribution as opposed to aqueous solubility um, what is the skin used for in your body? Skin, when, uh, skin is actually a barrier. Function of skin is to pre prevent absorption of xenobiotics into general circulation. Xenobiotics are like foreign substances, and so it's a local. It's a barrier for a local drug ad ad absorption. So if you want to absorb a uh, drug into your body, sometimes it's hard to get through the skin, right? 
especially if you're it's like a lotion or, or more of a like a cream or something uh, so this molecule fluosinolone acetonide is a topical anti-inflammatory drug uh, for itching and dermatitis the problem is it's not absorbed in, uh, across the skin very readily so so what are we going to do uh, maybe change the structure in a way that allows it to absorb more readily not necessarily increase aqueous solubility but we just got to get it across the skin so this is another steroid um, acetonide is this um, this uh, functional group here which is kind of like a protected dye dye alcohol as you know from organic chemistry um, anyway so it's it's poorly absorbed so the prodrug design strategy is actually to make it more greasy and maybe even less aqueous soluble <coughs> and and it becomes this cream called fluosinus fluosinonide and I probably mispronounced that uh, but that here it's you're actually making it more greasy by adding an acetate group and then the acetate group is cleaved by esterases right absorbed through the skin and then esterases cleave it off so then it's uh, through your skin and then and then it does its anti-inflammatory drug stuff another example is uh, epinephrine it's administered into the cornea as an anti-glaucoma drug um, but it's poorly absorbed into the eye so maybe if, maybe if we because the eye has membranes greasy membranes as well so if we can make it a little greasier initially then it can absorb and then be uh, released so same kind of idea here we use um, these pivotal oil groups it's like a tributyl carbon or carbonyl uh, ester two of them on the phenols make it nice and uh, greasy so it crosses the membrane and then it gets cleaved by esterases and then epinephrine is released so this becomes uh, propine which is the uh, dipivolate version dipivol oil pivol oil epinephrine so in the cornea the esterases cleave it and then it liberates the drug um, and then site specificity. Let's uh, when we want a drug to act at one site versus another. <coughs> um, this is an interesting case. Oxyphenostatin is an intestinal antiseptic that's active only when it's administered rectally, and that's uh, makes it a little little challenging as a as a drug. Uh, a diester prodrug called Levima allows it to be administered orally and it has the same exact effect as hydrolyzed at the site of action by esterases. So that's, that's cool. It, it's a nice use of organic chemistry to um, to uh, improve the uh, the uh, route of administration I guess. So simply having these the diacetate <laughs> simple, simple conversion to the diacetate makes it orally available because then this is absorbed um, orally through your intestines and then and then it eventually gets cleaved by esterases and, and returns back to the drug. It's cool. Um, another drug, Adefovir is a hepatitis B reverse transcriptase inhibitor. Um, kind of analogous to AZT, which is the HIV-1 reverse tra transcriptase inhibitor. Um, it's very polar, not very orally bioavailable, a little too, too polar, so it just gets directly excreted. So prodrug strategy uh, was developed. So this is the drug. Uh, it's kind of got that sort of nucleotide looking structure. It's got a uh, this, uh, Phosphonate thing. I, I'm not sure the name of the functional group. It's not a phosphate because th that would require an oxygen here. Mm, phos phos something. I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, the prodrug strategy is simply to turn those uh, phosphorus hydroxy groups into these these uh, linked pivotal oil groups. And but interestingly. 
um, another and there's another example also um, which just ta you know attaches some other organic material in this uh, um, chlorophenol group out here these are two different drugs um, so uh, Hepsera is orally available but it has liver toxicity issues so it's bad <laughs> and if you're trying to treat hepatitis liver toxicity issues are kind of a big deal and it actually metabolizes to formaldehyde and formaldehyde is uh, also a, a liver toxin um, and that's why the second drug is maybe a little bit better um, it activates uh, the prodrug Prodefovir activates in a manner that avoids liver toxicity, so it just cleaves this directly. Where does formaldehyde come from? Well, formaldehyde's a one-carbon aldehyde, and maybe if you look around, you, you'll see a one-carbon piece somewhere that might degrade to formaldehyde. And it's actually this this carbon right here and here that gets kind of cleaved in the process, which um, which ultimately leads to formaldehyde. It's a hepatotoxin. Um, oh, actually, ye, I think this is, this is the same uh, slide. And actually, um, the the linker, that one carbon linker, makes this technically a tripartite drug, which is something else we're going to get into later. So it's it's really it's it's the drug, and then you have a linker, and then you have the carrier, and the carrier actually gets cleaved, and then the linker gets cleaved, and then the final drug gets liberated. Um, and there's a pathway that um, that uh, actually uh, in the degradation of this other of the, the other molecule on the right, um, there is a um, um, like a Michael reaction that can be scavenged by glutathione. Because remember, glutathione is a uh, a scavenger for electrophiles, right? And Anyway, so let's let's just show the uh, the how this thing falls apart because there's a little bit uh, more chemistry that's going on for the degradation of this prodrug. So cyto cytochrome P four fifty three A oxidizes the CH, <coughs> and so this has its own kind of potential toxicity issue as well. So when the when this position gets oxidized, there becomes an alcohol and then a base takes off the proton. This uh, kind of releases one part of the phos phosphorus group. And then a base takes off this proton to release the other side. And then we actually have a Michael acceptor. And a Michael acceptor is an electrophile. And so one of the things that uh, uh, can happen, because this is, this is electrophilic, is that glutathione would attack it and, and uh, kind of attached to it. And glutathione also has the, the, a couple of amino acids and stuff, so this thing's readily excreted. Um, so both of these actually kind of have potential liver issues. Um, one, the f formaldehyde that can be generated from this one, and the other, which is this Michael acceptor, but this can be easily scavenged by glutathione. Okay, um, let's talk about uh, stability, uh, a prodrug that pr promotes stability. Oops. Uh, propran propranolol is a beta adrenergic receptor a antagonist. It's a beta blocker. It's one of those things used for like hypertension and things like that. Um, it has significant first pass metabolism, P450 stuff, with oral administration, and also as well as you know the phase one metabolism. It also has phase two metabolism like glucuronidation, had, uh, 
well, hydroxylation is a phase one metabolism. And all of these can be avoided by IV administration, which is nice, but if we can provide a drug orally, it's usually um, more ideal. Okay, so what what are some of the bad things that can happen metabolically? Uh, glucuronidation of the alcohol, um, aromatic hydroxylation, the, all of those things are potential problems. So one of the things that we can do uh, to improve uh, stability of the of the drug and prevent first pass metabolism, so you know, make sure it gets through your liver first and then release the drug. Uh, you know, and aromatic hydroxylation still can occur, but if we attach that sux uh, succinate group that we talked about before, then you have this four carbon piece attached. We we saw that and how it it degrades. Basically, this oxygen attacks that oxygen, kicks us off, um, and that actually kind of avoids, uh, you know, at least the uh, phase two metabolism of the alcohol. What are some of the ways you could re maybe redu remove the uh, aromatic hydroxylation? Sometimes people add like a fluorine group or maybe a chlorine group on the on the benzene and that, that would prevent that kind of metabolism. But anyway, this prodrug, the hemisuccinate ester, blocks first pass glucuronidation. The blood plasma levels are eight times greater with the prodrug, so that's good. It's a successful prodrug strategy. Um, we have that mechanism a few slides ago on solumedrol um, on how that's metabolized if you want to well it's not metabolized I guess it's it's really uh, it's just kind of an automatic degradation that's not enzymatic but it works the, the, drug, the prodrug works okay improved stability uh, another example um, Naltrexone is a mu opioid receptor antagonist. It's you, you know, as opposed to the mu opioid receptor agonists like morphine, codeine, fentanyl. This is an antagonist it's used in addiction uh, treatment. Um, it's well absorbed orally, but it has significant first pass metabolism. And so, if we can block the first pass metabolism in the liver, then it, then the drug actually has more activity. So, I think we used this example before. So this is kind of a standard um, opioid uh, um, skeleton. And but with the cyclopropyl group, um, I think that in, in that hydroxy group, I think these things turn it from an agonist into an antagonist. Um, but the prodrug design is essentially nal naltrexone anthranolate, which is essentially this uh, benzene with the amino benzene linked through an ester, and also naltrexone acetyl salicylate, which is this is essentially aspirin, right? So in, when the uh, ester gets cleaved, it, it re releases aspirin, um, and I don't think that is, I mean, the fact that it has to ha happens to release aspirin is not really uh, something I, I think that was designed. It was, it was just, it, it's a nice um, kind of biologically, well, it's, it's not, it's not inert. I mean, it, it is a uh, uh, painkiller, but it's released in very small concentrations um, and, and uh, that eventually, uh, converting to naltrexone. Uh, so these two prodrug strategies enhanced oral bioavailability 45-fold and 28-fold respectively. So just the oral bioavailability increases substantially by having the, either of these two esters. That's pretty cool. Uh, slow and prolonged response. So this is another interesting use of a carrier-linked bipartite prodrug. Um, if we, we want a slow response, like a time release drug, one strategy is to ex attach a long and maybe slowly hydrolyzed ester chain, and then this can get absorbed into your plasma proteins and and things and um, into greasy uh, tissue in your body. 
so haloperidol and uh, flufenazine are antipsychotic drugs with a peak plasma level at about six to eight hours. That means they're, they uh, absorb and then they have uh, effect that kind of maxes out at about 68 hours. So how can we change the structures of these drugs so that they, they maybe last a little bit longer? It's just haloperidol. It's this kind of uh, ketone with a amine and a hydroxy group and chlorophenol. Uh, so the prodrug strategy is basically just attach a long greasy ester to it. And by doing that, it, it, um, it lasts a lot longer in your body. It's kind of a greasy, uh, slowly hydrolyzed ester. Uh, flufenazine um, kind of resembles thorazine, I think. It's this weird uh, th uh, arrangement of heterocycles. Um, and it's the same kind of thing for the prodrug design. It's just make a big, long, greasy ester attached to it. And the long chain ester prodrugs cause the drugs to be stored in fatty tissue and it increases the duration to a month. So you can basically, well, uh, uh, not have to administer it all the time. So that's pretty cool. Minimize toxicity. Um, <coughs> so we talked about some of these prodrugs. Um, to that that can decrease the toxic side effects of the drugs, the like the uh, glaucoma treatment. Um, we talk well, and this this is also a uh, the this was used to kind of enhance the the um, absor absorption across the. Uh, into the eye, but so th th so yeah that's, that's what I was trying to say. Um, so there's actually a there there is a um, this is toxic. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah yeah the, the epinephrine is actually kind of toxic, but by making the drug more efficiently absorbed, then we can ab absorb less of it in, in a smaller dose, so toxic side effects are less severe. That's what it, <laughs> I can't remember what I, was, what I was trying to say here. And that, that's, so that's exactly it. So, so this uh, is actually toxic. There's both, they're both toxic, but if you absorb, or administer less of the prodrug, then the toxicity is diminished. Epinephrine is toxic in high doses. Propine decreases the required dose. Um, another use of prodrugs is to encourage patient acceptance um, of the drug and, and um, maybe avoid uh, kind of a, like a nasty taste or something like that. And then because if you don't do that, people just won't take the drug because they get uh, turned off by the, the flavor or, or taste of the, the substance. Example. Um, so for drugs to be effective, patients need to take it. Sometimes an unpleasant taste or odor or painful injection uh, will serve as a hindrance for using the drug. Uh, so one, one cool example is this molecule called clindamycin, which is a broad spectrum antibiotic with a horrible taste. Um, but if you, if you attach a phosphate group or a palmitate group, the prodrugs uh, don't have any flavor at all. So probably what provides the horrible taste is the uh, sulfide, maybe the chloroalkane, I guess. Uh, but this is clindamycin. It's a antibiotic drug. Um, and the prodrug is just attach a phosphate. And then and now it doesn't have uh, the, the kind of nasty uh, taste. So it's uh, clindamycin phosphate or dallicin. Another example is clindamycin palmitate, which just has a big, long, greasy chain out here. And that's uh, cleosin pediatric is what it becomes the name of it. Uh, 
Another example is the antibacterial sulfa drug called sulfasoxazole. Remember what they do? They interfere with bacterial folate metabolism. Um, and uh, basically inhibit the uh, production of, uh, of uh, key building blocks that the bacteria uses in its metabolism. Um, okay, so it has a bitter taste, and you can get rid of that bitter taste by attaching a sediment uh, group. That's sulfoxazole. It says the, the oxazole heterocycle on it. Simply attaching the uh, acetate group on this nitrogen, which is cleavable by... I'm not, not sure how that exactly is cleaved. Maybe, I don't know if it's a peptidase. It's not exactly a peptide. Um, but amides are, are cleavable, cleavable functional groups. By doing this, it gets rid of the, the kind of nasty taste. And if we combine this with a tasteless version of erythromycin, which is another uh, broad spectrum antibiotic, um, <coughs> and here is the uh, ethyl succinate group here down, highlighted. So this, again, is that same kind of strategy we talked about earlier a couple times now. Uh, but this, th this is an ethyl ester. So the ethyl ester gets cleaved, and that makes a succinate. And then the, this oxygen would attack the other oxygen and, um, and then break this off. And that, that kind of liberates the drug, erythromycin. Okay? And this, these two drugs are combined, these nice non-nasty flavored substances are combined into a delicious strawberry banana suspension called pediazole, which is a, a formulation of, of both of these that can be used in maybe a kind of like a digestive tract infection or something like that. So this is the uh, strawberry banana version of this, of this um, drug. These drugs. Okay, so now we're going to get into the carrier link tripartite prodrugs. So these have an extra linker type thing attached to them. Alright, so what, what's this idea of these uh, carrier link tripartite prodrugs? <clears throat> the idea is you have a carrier, you get a linker, you have a drug. Maybe an enzyme will come and cleave uh, the carrier, and then the linker kind of gets uh, sort of falls off, and then um, and then you release the drug. That's one way to imagine it. How does this often looks in a drug? Maybe we'll have a drug with a uh, X, some kind of uh, you know, oxygen, nitrogen, ester, or something, and then like a like a uh, esterase will cleave this this ester on the right, and have this arrangement of like O minus CH two, and then like the, you know, some kind of X group, and that that can readily fall apart. So O minus kicks in, and then this falls apart, and then you're left with um, you know, carboxylic acid, some kind of prodrug element, and then you have your drug with the X group, and then you have formaldehyde. We already talked about how formaldehyde can be kind of nasty. I mean, um, depending on where where formaldehyde is released, if it's released in your liver, that can be a problem. If you, especially if you, if you have uh, hepatitis, because it's a sort of a toxic byproduct. But you know, a little bit of formaldehyde is not necessarily uh, a deal breaker for. A lot of a lot of patients. Okay, so let's look at some examples of antibiotics. Uh, ampicillin prodrugs, which we've talked about, they they're involved in. It's just a, a penicillin derivative. Um, that's involved in the, the cell wall um, biosynthesis inhibition. Um, so penicillin derivatives are poorly absorbed, and normal bipartite prodrugs are actually kind of bad because they're cleaved um, rapidly by, by esterases. And um, actually a big problem <laughs> is that 
<coughs> it, it, like if you have if you have something like ampicillin, it requires a higher dose. Which if you take it orally, it's going to kill uh, intest intestinal and uh, gut flora. So the sort of essential bacteria in your intestinal lining, and it's, it can cause you know um, sort of intestinal problems. Okay, so ampicillin is is just a standard um, penicillin like antibi antibiotic, and so. Um, so one of the things people have done is, is create a, a tripartite um, uh, prodrug strategy, and by being tripartite, it 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 prolongs the stability a little bit. So it's not just like I mean we we, could, we you know we could make a, a bipartite prodrug, but it'd be cleaved kind of rapidly, and then it doesn't really have much of an effect. And for this this drug, that's actually kind of a big deal. So. The use of a tripartite strategy slows the in initial cleavage event, and that's that makes it a little bit better. So the prodrug design is um, um, from the ester from the carboxylic acid uh, to have a little linker here with an extra carbon, and then like a ethyl carbonate or something like that. And so what happens then is the esterases will uh, cleave the uh, this uh, uh, ethyl carbonate that that creates this uh, hemiacetal functional group with the OH and the oxygen this kicks in breaks it off and you're left with acetaldehyde which you know has a little bit little bit of toxicity but depending on where it's released is not not that big of a deal um, it can be oxidized to acetic acid and CO2 so you cr you create um, uh, so this this uh, ethyl uh, carbonate thing degrades to make CO2 and ethanol, and so those are uh, readily uh, well not not really considered a problem. Um, here's a cool cool thing. Let's uh, get my photo out of the way there for the reference by Boder, uh, Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences, 1987. Um, here's a cool idea. A trick to pass antibiotics through the blood-brain barrier. So, so d drugs um, have difficulty getting through the blood-brain barrier. So, how can we change the drugs so that they can get through the blood-brain barrier? And the blood-brain barrier is kind of a greasy membrane that um, just presents challenges in drug design. Uh, so, it's a nonpolar. It allows compounds that that uh, pass it mu that must be kind of greasy and nonpolar, but that sort of limits um, structures um, that um, well it, it, it kind of requires them to be greasy and nonpolar. <coughs> so, so so here's a pretty cool trick. It's the dihydropyridine method from Boder. Um, So if you have a drug kind of tethered through an X group to a carbonyl, and then this this thing's called a dihydropyridine because it's related to normal pyridine, which is um, ba basically this thing over here minus the stuff around it. That's that's pyridine. So dihydropyridine just has uh, two double bonds. This is actually kind of a greasy uh, uh, um, conjugate, and it crosses the blood-brain barrier, so it gets into your brain. And then, inside the brain, it gets enzymatically oxidized into the uh, pyridinium, which is a positively charged thing. That kind of locks it in the brain because now it's at, at that point, it um, it becomes polar, right? And then this can get hydrolyzed. This linkage gets gets hydrolyzed, and that releases the drug. And then this kind of pyridinium thing, so so pretty much gets the stuff into the brain, and then it kind of traps it in the brain because now everything's a little uh, less greasy. Okay, it's a pretty cool cool strategy. Um, here's an implementation of that strategy for the uh, delivery of beta lactam antibiotics for the treatment of bacterial meningitis, so it's a, like a bacterial infection in your brain. So um, here is uh, some kind of random penicillin derivative. Um, 
has that kind of that sort of CH2 linkage that makes it a tripartite linkage. It gets enzymatically oxidized, so it kind of pass, passes into the brain as sort of a greasy conjugate. Once it's inside the brain, it gets oxidized, and you get the pyridinium, methylpyridinium thing. And then esterases will uh, cleave it, um, cleave the uh, ester linkage, and then this degrades and makes formaldehyde, and it releases the the drug. Now, it, I and I haven't really uh, explored this too too uh, much, but I think this would only really work if the the enzymes that do the oxidation. Um, are not, <laughs> are, uh, are maybe maybe higher concentration in the brain, right? Um, because this is kind of ex assumed to happen inside the brain, and um, I, I haven't, I, I actually, I I've looked at these papers, but I haven't uh, looked at that specific question. But that, to me, that's a, that's an interesting point: is is what which which enzymes do the oxidation, and and um, I imagine they have a, a higher concentration in the brain. Another um, kind of cool similar strategy <coughs> involves a flavofluorouracil uh, to treat some skin infections. Um, it's it's kind of used as an anti-tumor drug, but it, it's uh, it also can um, it's kind of toxic to bacteria and microorganisms as well. Okay, so uh, interestingly. Uh, microorganisms like fungi and bacteria have permease enzymes that uptake peptides with very little peptide specificity. So they they uh, they they look it's kind of weird that these <laughs> microorganisms will kind of just sort of suck in molecules that have uh, like a peptide looking thing, and it doesn't really care what the what else is on there. So uh, and it, it, I think it. Then tries to utilize the amino acid building blocks and things as you know to enhance the survival of the microorganism. Okay, so it can be exploited as a prodrug strategy. <laughs> so, we're, so what we're doing with prodrugs is we're exploiting normal bio biochemical processes to make drugs better, right? All right, so this is what what we have. We have five fluorouracil essentially attached to a. Um, like a glycine almost. It's like a, a glycine amino acid and that's attached to an alanine amino acid. So there's a couple amino acids. These are the kind of the tag that the, the microorganism is kind of excited by. <laughs> so so uh, the permease allows this whole thing to get, kind of get sucked into the microorganism and then once it's inside the microorganism then peptidases cleave off like the alanine and that, then you're left with the uh, glycine and the glycine nitrogen kicks in, breaks off the 5-fluorouracil, it does all the nasty stuff uh, to the uh, bacteria or whatever, and creates this molecule which kind of gets degraded into a peroxy, um, I don't know what that, uh, is it pyruvate or whatever, one of those metabolites I guess. But uh, yeah, it's a pretty cool trick that, that can be used to kind of get drugs into a into a microorganism like a bacteria or fungus. Okay, let's talk about this idea of bio precursor prodrugs. All right. <coughs> so um we're gonna we have a couple examples of these bio precursor prodrugs. So what are they? Uh, the idea is kind of like the carrier-linked prodrugs, bipartite and tripartite that we were talking about. The tripartite kind of have, a, have some sort of linker in them. Usually, there's an ester cleavage event that um, activates the or releases the prodrug. Okay, bioprecursor prodrugs are usually activated by a metabolic oxidation or reduction reaction. So it's a little different. Um, may use uh, um, P450 or, or something like that. Um, but our first example is a different one that uses a unique activation method of a prodrug by protonation. So the simple protonation of the drug 
uh, is actually kind of what activates it and causes it to work. Oops. Okay. Uh, so we're going to talk about omeprazole. Remember that stuff? It's a proton pump inhibitor. Uh, it's activated by proton, <laughs> which is convenient because we're inhibiting the proton pump where there's an abundance of protons. Uh, it's a series of, uh, so, so first of all, there's a bunch of molecules that are evaluated in the 70s for inhibition of the proton potassium ATPase, which is also called the proton pump, which, which basically what it does is it secretes acid in the stomach through parietal, parietal cells. Um, and that's a great drug target because it's used to treat diseases or conditions like pep peptic ulcers, heartburn, uh, GERD, which is gastroesophageal uh, reflux disorder, uh, H. pylori infections, kind of like sort of stomach problems in general. Um, and so we can discover inhibitors of this. We, we can treat a whole bunch of conditions. And it's a huge market. I mean, this is like a you know, billion dollar, multi-billion dollar uh, uh, drug target, essentially. So several compounds were identified in the optimization process. Um, and the, and the, the story of how these kind of went from molecule to molecule is kind of interesting. I'm not going to get into that, but ultimately, as they as they progressed and they may went from the from one molecule to the next, they eventually got to uh, omeprazole, uh, which is this uh, this uh, sulfoxide thing. We we talked about this earlier in terms of the um, chirality. Remember, this is a chiral molecule, and this is because of the sulfur chirality. So this is a, a common over-the-counter. Um, uh, kind of heartburn drug works really well. Um, I remember also that because it is uh, the sulfur chirality, uh, I think I forgot which drug company made it, but they also made the the single enantiomer of the sulfur uh, chiral center, and then I think it's called S-meprazole, which is the uh, S <laughs> isomer. So yes, there's a sulfur chirality issue. And I think uh, yes, I think it's supposed to write um, S meprazole, E S E meprazole there, but I, I wrote M meprazole. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So it activ it's activated by a proton. So there, there's a dr uh, a activation event by proton, and then it essentially will. Uh, let's move my face out of the way. Um, irreversibly binds to cysteines in the proton potassium ATPase channel protein. So, um, how does that work? Um, so, uh, here's the proton protonation event. So, one, uh, there's a pretty interesting mechanism that was deduced in these two uh, papers. I think the JAX papers may be a little more, um, I mean, it figured out this crazy mechanism. Uh, but yeah, ni uh, pyridine nitrogen attacks the um, benzimidazole there, and then the nitrogen grabs the proton in this uh, environment with a high abundance of uh, protons. And then the, the benzimidazole nitrogen swings back, kicks this off, and makes this hydroxy uh, uh, I don't know what that's called, uh, hydroxythiol, I don't, um, I'm, I'm not too sure. Um, and then the other benzimidazole nitrogen swings in and the double bond recyclizes to make a kind of a nitrogen sulfur linkage and then cysteine from the protein gets attached. So this now, be, this sulfur is now electrophilic and the cysteine is nucleophilic attacks and now you formed a disulfide linkage with the uh, with the uh, drug. So you've you've attached a molecule to your your proton potassium ATPase um, proton uh, the the proton pump, right? Okay. So uh, for a meprazole, the there's two cysteines, one cysteine eight one three, and the other is cysteine eight ninety two. For the other proton pump inhibitors, 
pantoprazole and lansoprazole. It's different cysteines, cysteine 813 and cysteine 321 that get attached to the drug. Uh, I couldn't find an x-ray crystal structure that shows this. It would be kind of cool to see how it binds, but I, I, at least when I, when I checked, I didn't see one, how it binds covalently. Um, it is, or maybe the question might be, is it concerning that omeprazole is covalently and irreversibly binding to our proton pumps? Is that bad? Uh, does the protein recover later? after the drug treatment? I mean, that's an interesting question. Are we permanently disabling our proton pumps? Uh, it does not appear to be a big problem because the protein is uh, resynthesized continuously, so it's turned over in the body. So so it's inactivated, but then it kind of gets regenerated, so that's not a big deal. Uh, but the, dr the drug can have an effect for up to a couple days, which is actually kind of nice if you're experiencing kind of a, uh, a large recurrence of heartburn. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the other thing is those uh, the covalently attached intermediates could break down with like maybe glutathione or something like that. Uh, so it, it is, it's not like you're permanently um, modifying the protein. But, e but even so, it gets resynthesized, so it's not, not, the, not a huge deal. Okay, so uh, let's see a little bit, a couple more references on that. Interestingly, um, somebody created a reversible proton pump inhibitor that kind of avoids these issues. It does not irreversibly modify the proton pump. Um, and there is an X-ray crystal structure that's kind of cool for this reversible drug. So this is an X-ray crystal structure of the proton pump bound to the reversible non-covalently binding inhibitor. It's called vanoprazin or venoprazin. Um, so it's a uh, you know it's a uh, channel protein. So it has a, a membrane and. Um, I'm visualizing this with Pymol. The PDB is 6YLU. Um, so there's kind of two parts. There's the uh, there's the inside, which is the top. There's the cy cytoplasm of the parietal cell, and then there's the the bottom is the space inside the stomach, I guess. And a proton gets pumped out, potassium gets pumped in, and um, and we're trying to inhibit that, right? We're trying to inhibit the, the, the pumping out of protons. There's the drug, venoprazin, um, bound kind of in this, this sort of, this little binding site here. Um, Here's another depiction of the uh, drug that's kind of, where's my face, let's get it out of there. Put it up there now. Um, that's kind of bound in this little cluster of alpha helices. Um, I I interestingly, it's, it, the drug is kind of near some of these cysteines that bound, are bound usually to, uh, to where uh, omeprazole binds. So you can kind of see where the, the SAH of the cysteines um, are. Okay, then we're going to have another example. So that was, that was it for omeprazole. It's kind of an interesting story, and it's interesting how it... Um, how it um, well, it's, it's proton activated as a as a prodrug. Um, <coughs> this is another example. Well, kind kind of the the standard example of bio precursor prodrugs using oxidative uh, metabolism, like p450 mediated metabolism, to generate. Uh, an active form of a drug. One one just kind of textbook example is demethylation of a um, 
benzodiazepam type analog which generates anti-anxiety drugs like Xanax or Halcyon. So here they have a dimethyl amino group that um, that gets oxidatively dealkylated, so it's cytochrome P450. So that remember that how that happened. Basically, hy uh, hydroxylation of a methyl group that falls apart, and you get an NH. Do it again with P450. Then you have a uh, NH2 that kicks in and um, and uh, forms an amine derivative, and that that creates these sort of diazepam analogs. This is just, just another example, but it's actually using P450 as part of the activation process. So that's a P450 mediated oxidative demethylation. That's another P450 mediated, mediated oxidative demethylation. And then uh, that produces Xanax um, and Halcyon, which are these benzodiazepine derivatives. And I, I don't actually know if this is, uh, you know, th I think this is just an interesting example of it. I don't know if this is actually used as a prodrug orally because these these drugs are actually pretty effective um, uh, already, and it is taken orally. So the benzodiazepines are, you know, orally active already. Um, but this was just, you know, just an example of how how we can how we can use oxidative metabolism to. Um, kind of create a biologically active substance. What about reductive metabolism? We can cleave functional groups like an azolinker as a product strategy and it's actually used in the early uh, sulfa drug antibiotics. One of them is a prontosil, it's a sulfa drug, it's a PABA analog like a lot of the sulfa drugs which is a uh, inhibitor of dihydrofolate reductase. Um, so th this is actually kind of an interesting historical example of a prodrug. Uh, one of the earliest discover, uh, discovered antimicrobial drugs. So prontosil has this azo linkage, which is um, reduced metabolically, probably P450 and AD NADPH, to make the uh, sulfa antibiotic drug, which is kind of like a PABA analog, right? Like Kind of like, a, uh, was it paramino benzoic acid? And then it creates this kind of weird thing that's probably probably toxic. <laughs> I don't know. I imagine that has some liver toxicity issues with the, the anilines. But anyway, the, the, the drug uh, was called Prontosil, and it, um, uh, some of the early, early packaging of it, uh, another example is um, a, a slightly different analog called sulfasalazine or MNB693. I think it's still used in veterinary medicine. Same kind of thing. Cleave the azo linkage with P450 and NADPH to make the PABA analog and form amino salicylic acid. This is probably a little bit less um, uh, bad, I guess, and probably easily excreted. Uh, here's the, the labeling of it. Uh, <laughs> it's marked as a poison. Uh, kind of created around 1943. There's an interesting historical anecdote from uh, Winston Churchill uh, who said, who was basically cured of, his, of a bacterial pneumonia. Whoa, why is that happening? And uh, quoted as saying, "This <laughs> I can't speak like Winston Churchill, but uh, this ad admirable M and B from which I did not suffer any inconvenience, I guess meaning no toxic side effects, was used at the earliest moment, and a week's and after a week's fever, the intruder was repulsed um, in a wartime uh, radio address after being treated." For uh, pneumonia, which is pretty um, a bacterial um, uh, pneumonia infection, which could have been lethal, so it just showed kind of a historical use of the drug and that, that it actually worked.
Um, all right, I think we're <coughs> ready for this case study in hydrogels as a vehicle for drug delivery, which is a pretty cool little case study. Uh, I have uh, friends that work at a company here in, in San Francisco that um, that um, have basically developed a, a, a drug delivery technology called hydrogels and, and use it as a, as a sort of a slowly degrading uh, matrix that releases a drug at a site of um, action. And anyway, I'm going to talk about that next time. Uh, and I think, and then we're kind of onward to antibody drug conjugates. We're kind of slowly getting done with our material here, and it, but we'll have a, maybe a couple, a couple more lectures. All right. Uh, have a wonderful night.